uh, in the last lecture we discussed uh, some of the important uh, decision procedure methods. One such method which occupied the central position for this course that is the semantic tablox method. So using the semantic tablox method uh, we discussed uh, 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 about validity of a given well formed formula in the predicate logic and we also discussed something about when do we say that two statements or two sentences in the predicate logic are said to be consistent. So in this lecture what we will be doing is we will be taking up another important proof procedure method which also serves as a kind of decision procedure method. So that is the natural deduction method. Natural deduction method simply involves uh, some, uh, some principles of uh, logic. This is what we have already discussed in the context of propositional logic where we used some of the important uh, pr uh, valid principles of uh, logic such as modus ponens, modus tollens, constructive dilemma, destructive dilemma, etc. These are all valid principles which we have taken into consideration and then we proved some of the important theorems. If something is a valid formula, it has to find a proof. So in that context, in order to prove that particular kind of valid formulas, all the valid formulas in your formal system, so we have used natural deduction as one of the important uh, decision procedure method for proving a particular kind of well formed formula. So uh, natural deduction in the context of predicate logic is slightly different from that of uh, uh, natural deduction in case of propositional logic although it is considered to be an extension of uh, uh, natural deduction in case of proposition logic. So in the predicate logic we have quantifies and, and hence we have some new set of rules uh, in the context of predicate logic. So I will be discussing these rules first, uh, then we will be talking about uh, some of the examples so that we will get ourselves familiarized with the, this particular kind of technique that is the natural deduction method. So uh, another important thing which you need to note is, is that natural deduction is somewhat closer to uh, the way humans reason because it involves simple principles of reasoning such as modus ponens etc and all. Uh, which are which which comes closer to the human commonsensical reasoning and all. So that's why they find importance uh, in uh, importance, especially in uh, coming up with some important kind of decision procedure method. So all these methods ha has its own importance, but uh, there are some methods which are closer to human reasoning, and there are some which uh, close to uh, in, uh, to the implementation of uh, machine automated reasoning etc. So it is based on our convenience we will be using these particular kinds of methods. At least 4 or 5 methods which we have discussed in this course. We started with the truth table method and then we moved to semantic tablox method and then we discussed something about resolution refutation method uh, and then we also discussed uh, something like uh, reducing the given formula into conjunctive and disjunctive normal forms and then we can talk about whether that given formula is a tautology or not. And then we also discussed uh, uh, about natural deduction method in the context of propositional logic. So now as natural deduction involves uh, 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 some kind of to start with we have simple proofs and there are indirect proofs and then we have conditional proofs. Uh, uh, usually it is uh, divided into two parts one is conditional proof another one is based on uh, another one is considered to be indirect proof which is based on reductio ad absurdum. In the reductio ad absurdum what you will do is uh, you start with the given formula and what you do is you will negate the formula and then you will see whether it leads to contradiction or not. If it leads to contradiction then the negation of the formula is unsatisfiable that means the original formula has to be a true that means it has to be a valid formula. So we will be talking about these three important proofs in the context of natural deduction. So apart from all the rules of uh, propositional uh, natural deduction for the propositional logic where we have a list of rules. Sometimes it is difficult to remember these rules but uh, in general they are simple valid principles of uh, logic uh, like modus ponens, modus tollens etc. Apart from all the rules that are there for the propositional logic since we have quantifies for the predicate logic and we need to formulate some kind of rules for the uh, rules with respect to the quantifies. The first rule states like this which is called as universal instantiation. So that means you are trying to find out one instance of uh, a particular kind of uh, uh, 
sentence such as for all x there a x implies p x a x implies b x. Suppose if you have a formula like for all x p x one instance of that one is just p uh, where x is replaced by some kind of ground term c. So that is p c is considered to be an instance of uh, for all x uh, p x. So universal instan instantiation allows us to replace a universal quantifier that is for all x with any arbitrary constant. So uh, for any such kind of arbitrary con constant that p c has to be true you can take p d p c p f anything for all kinds of that uh, arbitrary variables that sentence for all x p x is going to be true that is p c is going to be true that is p is true of everything then it is true of any individual thing we cite for example if you say that all crows are black then if you find out uh, a specific kind of crow and that crow also has to be black that is one instance of that particular kind of universal proposition. And the second one is this thing which is a little bit tricky uh, to use uh, in particular. Uh, suppose if you have uh, a formula such as P of V uh, then you can generalize it and say that uh, for all x P x. So it allows us to assume an arbitrary individual V and you can establish some fact about that particular kind of thing. So that means if something is true of uh, that particular kind of variable V then you can say that it must be true of anything just like you know mortality is attributed to a single human being for example and then every human being has to die someday or other so that is why mortality is attributed to all the human beings. So it is in that, in that sense we are generalizing we are generalizing a particular instance to uh, we are generalizing it and then forming universal general, uh, generalization. So universal instantiation can instantiate, instantiate any constant including V. Uh, whereas in this case so there is some kind of restriction which we need to impose on uh, this particular kind of variable v that exists here. So this is the second rule now the third rule is uh, existential generalization suppose if you have a term p c all these things are considered to be terms and all we discussed what we mean by terms in the last uh, few lectures. So if you come across a, a term p c that means something is the case then you can generalize it and say that there exists something that p x is the case. Suppose if you say that this uh, uh, duster is yellow then you can say that there exists some x that is x is considered to be duster and then that, that particular kind of duster is yellow in color. So that is what is existential generalization because there exists some x p x is true uh, especially when at least one object satisfies that particular kind of property. And the fourth rule is existential instantiation which tells us that if, if you have a formula there exists some x p x in the proof in particular when you come across this particular kind of formula in the proof you can always find one instance of that one that is uh, you can replace it with uh, p w in the, in the sequence of your proofs but you need to be a little bit cautious in using this rule whenever you replace the existential quantifier uh, each time you, you replace the existential quantifier you need to use a different kind of parameter. That means if you use w earlier in, in your proof you are not supposed to use the same w uh, which comes uh, next time when you replace this uh, existential quantifier. So each time uh, use that w has to be a new one. So this rule tells us that if you know that some property holds for at least one individual then we can, uh, we can, we can say that uh, we can name that particular kind of individual. If you say that something is black in color then you can say that you can, you can uh, specify a particular kind of individual and say that this uh, object is black in color. So these are the four rules uh, that we have which are expressed uh, in this sense universal instantiation for all x p x you substitute it as a substitute p c and if you have universal, uh, universal in the universal generation if you have p v then you generalize it and say that for all x p x with some restrictions and existential generalization if you have a p c then uh, p of c then you can so replace it with there exists some x p x etc all these things which we have discussed just now. So now uh, how do we know that we have applied these rules correctly you know. So let us consider some examples uh, with which we can we will come to know whether we have applied these rules correctly or not. So now uh, the first thing is universal instantiation rule 
which tells us that for all x p x we can obtain p c. Now the correct application of that one is like this in the first case for all z f z. So now in this one z is replaced by a so then it becomes f a that is seems to be the correct kind of application. In the same way uh, for example if you have for all x dx and ex then uh, one instance of that one is going to be uh, db and eb here it should be read as for all x. So, so what is considered to be the incorrect application of uh, this particular kind of rule. The rule tells us that for all x px you replace it with pc uh, now uh, for example if you have a formula like this for all y p y you cannot uh, simply say that it is not p y. So why because uh, you have to first transform this particular kind of formula into the corresponding formula then only you can substitute uh, uh, the variables with some kind of constants. So this will change to there exists some y not p y then you can substitute uh, an instance of this one and then you can say that p c or something like that. So directly you are not supposed to substitute uh, if you if you come across not for all not y p y you are not supposed to substitute straight away not p y you have to change it to the appropriate form then you make substitutions then that is going to be the correct one. So that is one thing and then in the second case uh, that you are seeing here for all x f x for all y z y in the only in the first instance uh, you find some kind of universal instantiation and the next one you did not uh, do we did not find any universal instance for that particular kind of thing and then that also it, this way of applying the rule is also considered to be uh, uh, incorrect application of the rule that means you are not supposed to apply universal instantiation only to the part of it for example if you have uh, some formula like uh, ax implies bx and then you uh, this is the universal uh, universal quantifier uh, statement with the universal quantifier one instance of that one for example if you say that uh, for all you know, suppose if you have a formula like this for all x uh, p x implies for all x q x. Now uh, suppose if you replace uh, if you find only instance of this particular kind of thing and then you keep the other thing as it is then it is an incorrect application of that particular kind of rule that means universal instantiation does not apply to part of the sentences it applies to the whole sentence rather than parts now. So in the second case it applied to only parts that is why it is considered to be an incorrect application of universal instantiation. Now coming back to uh, coming to the existential generalization if something is the case then you can generalize it and say that there exists some x p x. The correct applications are like this if you find that something is having some kind of property p let us say this duster is yellow in color then you can generalize it and say that there exists some x such that x is green in color. So the here capital letter uh, capital F is F stands for predicate and x stands for individual objects within the domain the domain is considered to be inanimate objects such as chalk pieces uh, pens etc pcs etc. So now if you have uh, term db and eb then you generalize it and say that there exists some y dy and ey. So you are not supposed to say that there exists some y dy and just simply uh, eb or something like that part of the sentence cannot be generalized and all if you generalize it it has to be generalized it has to be it has to apply on the whole sentence. So then what are considered to be the incorrect application of this particular kind of rule. So why we are discussing all these rules we will be making use of these rules uh, in deriving some of the important valid formulas you know. So the idea here is, is that all the valid formulas should find some kind of proof. One of the important and effective decision procedure method that we are discussing today is the natural deduction method and the rules uh, that we employ in the natural deduction method are uh, will come uh, usually come closer to our human reason. So here uh, existential generalization the incorrect applications are like this suppose if you have uh, not gc uh, for example then you cannot simply substitute it as not ez and z z. So here the rule uh, incorrect application of this rule is like this you have a formula not gc that means 
uh, something is not black for example then you cannot say that there does not exist some x g c. So, this uh, needs to be ruled out and all. So, that is considered to be incorrect application of this rule in the same way part of the sentences you cannot apply uh, universal uh, existential generalization z d implies h d uh, only part of this thing you applied uh, this particular kind of rule that is the first part of this sentence second part you did not do anything that is why it is considered to be incorrect application of this rule. In the same way we can uh, see what is considered to be correct application of this rule uh, in case of existential instantiation and even uh, existential uh, generalization etcetera. So, this rule tells us that uh, existential instantiation for all x uh, sorry there exists some x p x from that you can you can specifically say something uh, is having some kind of property. So, each time uh, if you replace this particular kind of thing then each time you replace this quantifier that, that uh, term has to be it has to be new constant. So, correct application of this rule is uh, there, there exists some z f z you simply replace it with f a and then there exists some x d x and e x it is simply you are replacing it with uh, uh, a letter b uh, d x and e x will become d b and e b it is a universal instantiation. Now, existential instantiation there exists some x p x p w and there are these are considered to be the incorrect applications of this rules there exists some x g b and h x and then uh, you are replacing with uh, x with b only second part is applied uh, we applied this particular kind of rule. So, that that will not work here. So, only to the parts you cannot apply this particular kind of rule if you apply existential initialization you have to apply throughout this particular kind of formula. In the same way there exists some x f x f b f b is the formula which is already found there. Now, once you remove there exists some x f x in the in the sequence of this particular kind of thing one you already for have f b here that means b is already the parameter b is already used in two. So, when you are removing there exists some x f x you have to choose another parameter that means it has to be f c rather than f b. So, for example, if you have uh, in the proof you have this particular kind of things there are two different quantifiers for example there exists some x p x and q x there exists some x not q x or something like this. So, now first time when you remove this thing you choose one particular kind of parameter these are a b c are the individual constants which are also called as parameters. Um, first time when you remove this thing you use p a and q a that is considered to be one instance of this particular kind of thing and the second time when you remove this particular kind of thing when you instantiate it you have to choose another parameter which is other than this a. Now, this is going to become q b or any other you can use any other letter other than whatever letter that you have used in the earlier step of your proof. Suppose if you have used the same kind of parameter a then that is considered to be incorrect application now this existential instantiation rule. So, there is a there are three errors that uh, are possible here that is existentially instantiation instantiating to a constant that occurs in the earlier line of the proof if you use the same kind of parameter then that leads to error and the second one second way this error results in is like this existentially instantiation to instantiating to a constant that occurs in the last line of the proof or third one applying existential instantiation rule to only part of a line that also leads to uh, error. So, now coming back to uh, coming to the fourth rule universal generalization rule. So, we have p, p v and then you generalize it and say that uh, for all v p v where p c is an instance of for all x p x. So, now uh, correct applications of this rule are like this f a you generalize it and then you say that for all x f x some somebody is mortal means all human beings are mortal only with some kind of restriction you can use this particular kind of thing. So, d b and e b and then uh, correct application of this rule is for all y d y and e y incorrect applications uh, are like this. So, the above rule should be treated as a universal generalization I have written existential generalization that needs to be corrected here uh, the rule needs to be read like this p v 
uh, implies uh, uh, for all x px. So the rule should be read like this. Uh, instance of this one is for all x px. So forget about the, uh, the rule which is stated above. Uh, so the incorrect applications are like this. Suppose if you have a formula a b, that means uh, something applies to only some kind of specific situation. Then you cannot generalize it and say that for all x a x. All animals, for example, if uh, uh, cats, dogs have some uh, four legs and all, uh, we cannot say that all animals have four legs and all. There might be some animals uh, which might be having two legs, or maybe one leg, etc. And all. So we cannot generalize it and say for all x, a x and all. This is an incorrect application of this rule. In the same way, there exists some y, z, y, g, c, and then uh, you generalize it and say that for all y, g, y. So that is also considered to be an incorrect application of this particular kind of rule. So now uh, errors with respect to universal generalizations are like this universally generalizing suppose if you universally generalizing from a constant that appears in the premise or it might result in because of this thing universally generalizing from a constant that occurs in a line derived earlier by an application of uh, existential instantiation that is a rule number 2 incorrect use of rule number 2 which we have seen earlier. And the third one universal, universally generalizing from a constant that occurs in for all x uh, p x and then fourth one applying universal generalization to only part of uh, the line rather than the full line full formula you need to apply universal generalization if you do not apply it that is also considered to be incorrect application of this rule. So, so far we have discussed uh, something about the rules now we apply these rules to some kind of examples to start with we use some simple kind of examples all the uh, logic courses begin with this particular kind of example all humans are mortal Socrates is human therefore you are, you are trying to derive some human uh, some human being is considered to be mortal. So here hx represents x is human mx represents uh, x is mortal and then someone is uh, considered to be Socrates as well. So so how do we deduce this particular kind of thing uh, using these uh, rules. So now uh, as a first step uh, all humans are mortal for all x hx implies uh, mx all humans are mortal and second one is uh, hs there exists some person uh, Socrates which is considered to be human being and now from this we need to deduce this thing there exists some x such that that particular kind of x is considered to be mortal. So now how do we use natural deduction method to solve this particular kind of problem. So now we need to use only these two premises and then these two premises should lead to these two premises together with the rules that we have discussed earlier should lead to the conclusion that is one way of proving the, the this particular kind of thing so that is called as direct proof. There is another kind of method which we can use so we can negate the conclusion and see whether it results in a contradiction or not. So that is considered to be reductio ad absurdum kind of proof which is considered to be indirect proof we will see both the proofs now. So now uh, uh, these are the things which are given to you 1 to you label it as 1 and 2 so now so this is uh, hx implies mx happens for all x so one instance of that one is like this you take uh, s uh, you replace x with s that means one particular kind of uh, individual s is considered to be Socrates or anyone in human being. So now this one instance of this one is like this hs uh, m s so how did we get this one one you have used universal instantiation rule. Now fourth one uh, we use all the uh, basic principles that we have already used in the context of propositional logic like modus ponens, modus tollens all these things which we will be using. Modus ponens is uh, simply like this A implies B and then A and then it results in B and modus tollens A implies B not B and uh, usually it is you have to deny the antecedent as well and then there are some kind of other rules which are frequently used. The list of rules which I, we, which I already mentioned it in uh, uh, in the context of propositional logic when I discussed 
uh, natural reduction in the context of propositional logic. I discussed several rules. Just I'm writing very few of these rules, which which frequently occur. Uh, if you have, if you have a or b and you have not b, then a, etc. There are some lots of other rules and all. They're all considered to be valid principles in the sense that the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. So now coming back to this example. So now H s and H s implies M s. Uh, now two and three modus ponens will lead to M. Yes. So now this is not what exactly we uh, we are supposed to prove, but we need to prove this thing. There exists some x M x. So S is having some kind of property uh, M. That means at least one uh, one object in your domain is uh, satisfying uh, having this particular kind of property. So that means uh, you can use for existential generalization and you can say that there exists some x m x. So how did we get to this one? Suppose if, uh, if you say that this chalk piece is white in color and you can generalize it and say that there exists some x such that that x is considered to be white in color. There is nothing wrong in saying that particular kind of thing because it satisfies this particular kind of property. There exists some x f x is going to be true if at least one object is having that particular kind of property uh, f or g whatever it is. So now uh, this is what we got it in all for all x h x m x h s and uh, these things we got what we wanted there exists some x m x. So uh, one thing which you need to note is, is that uh, you need to write justification here immediately following uh, uh, your sequence of your proof otherwise it does not make any sense to talk about. Uh, it does not make any sense to talk about uh, what we call it as a correct proof. If it has to be correct and rigorous proof it has to find justification. So usually we write it at the right hand side extreme right hand side of uh, each uh, term in your proof. So now this is the direct method there is a, another way in which you can prove this uh, particular kind of thing. So, so that is indirect method indirect method that is reductio ad absurdum. So what you will do here is, is that you take the premises into consideration and you take the negation of this one and then see whether it leads to contradiction or not. So for all x that means you are looking for a counter example where your premises are true and the conclusion is false. So instead of looking for the validity what you are trying to do is you are ruling out instances which are considered to be invalid. So when you say that an argument is invalid when you have true premises and a false conclusion when you, you can cook up some example where uh, you have true premises and a false conclusion then obviously that argument is invalid. If you rule out all the cases of invalid thing and all obviously you will end up with validity. So now hx same thing you write it uh, like this uh, this is what is uh, given to you premises and the second one you list out the same thing third one. Uh, this is the conclusion separated by an oblique there exists some x m x. So now what you will do is you look for the counter example you assume that these two premises are true and then the conclusion is false m x. Then uh, this leads to you cannot directly apply uh, existential uh, instantiation rule and then say that it is m b and all this is wrong. So first you need to transform it into uh, the appropriate form that is not of there exists some x m x leads to this thing for all x this negation goes inside and then this will be like this. So this is 3 by definition so this leads to this one. So now uh, uh, one strategy of uh, again in the natural reduction is this that first you deal with the existential quantifiers and then you move to the universal quantifiers. So there are no existential quantifiers here. So, so now, uh, now we need to find instances of this one, and then we can find out uh, contradiction in this one. So now, one instance of this one is like this: H A uh, implies M A. So you can take uh, S also, uh, but I am take I have taken into consideration A. Doesn't make any big difference now. So. Yeah, it makes a difference because we have used S here. So, so we use uh, capital letter stands for the predicate and S for the individual object. Here, S refers to Socrates. 
So one instance of this one is this. Another instance of this one, this not mx holds for all x. That means it it might be true even for the Socrates also. Now, uh, how did we get this one? Five, one universal instantiation, and then four universal instantiation. We got this particular kind of thing. Now, uh, seven. We have a, a rule which we have discussed just now. X implies y, and not y implies not x. So this is x implies y, and not of this thing. Denial of the consequent leads to denial of the antecedent. So now this leads to HS. How did we get this one? Five and six modus tollens. So this is the rule that we have used here. So now observe this thing. You draw a line like this. And then in the eighth step, what we got is we have HS here and you have not HS here. So that means Socrates is human and then Socrates is not human. That is what we got. If you deny this particular kind of conclusion. So now uh, from this, you draw a line like this. You say that using reductio ad absurdum method, uh, what you got is the contradiction because HS and not HS is contradictory to each other. So now the denial of the denial of the conclusion leads to contradiction. That means uh, this is what is unsatisfiable. There exists some x m x leads to this one. That means the actual thing that has to be true is not of not of there exists some x m x. That means there exists some x m x has to be true. This is this is considered to be the original conclusion. So what essentially we have done here is this that uh, we have taken a simple example uh, the, uh, then we applied natural uh, the principles of natural reduction uh, and then we showed that the, uh, the conclusion follows from the premises that means the argument uh, is considered to be a valid argument by using both direct method and the indirect method. So indirect method is uh, uh, consider to be uh, sometimes uh, it will be more effective in a sense that suppose if the argument is invalid then uh, you keep on applying the rules and all you may not end up with uh, 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 because it is an invalid formula you will never be able to derive that particular kind of formula and all. So uh, indirect method uh, will, will come to our rescue so in many occasions uh, indirect method is the one which uh, is often widely used and all. But more or less the both the proofs are having uh, make are making use of these rules universal instantiation existential instantiation etc so let us consider some more uh, proofs so that you know we'll understand this thing uh, uh, this formula in a better way just i will go through this proof uh, these are the things which we have already used in the context of uh, uh, theory of syllogisms uh, aristotle has come up with this theory of syllogisms where all the sentences begin with some kind of special kind of prepositions which are considered to be categorical prepositions. So they all begin with all some none etc. They are also like this only so but not all the sentences can be in this particular kind of form so that is that sets limit to Aristotelian theory of syllogism but in the predicate logic one can express relations all these things in a better way. So we can overcome some problems which we have faced in the context of Aristotelian theory of syllogism. So now let us consider this particular kind of example. All trees are plants, all plants are living things. So all trees are living things. It is simple since the moment you see this particular kind of formula, it is clear that uh, it is some kind of transitivity property is there. Tx implies Px and Px implies Lx and then obviously Tx has to be Lx. So now what we have done is we listed out the two premises for all x tx implies px for all x px implies lx and then the conclusion is for all x tx implies lx. Now first you uh, applied this universal instantiation rule for number 1 then it has become ta implies pa. Now next time again you applied the universal instantiation rule on 2 that is for all x px implies lx. Since px implies lx is true for all x so we can use the same parameter. But if you have a different quantifier here uh, then you have to use uh, a different kind of thing. First you need to handle that thing and then you move on to universal kind of quantifier. So now if you apply 
universal instantiation rule to 2 it has become P A in place L A and now used again uh, the valid principles of logic in the context of natural reduction then there is a rule called as x implies y y implies z then x implies z and all this is this rule is called as hypothetical syllogism that is what we have used in the fifth step. So now once we have this particular kind of thing T A in place L A uh, which did which you did not come across uh, with an application of existential uh, with the elimination of uh, existential quantifier but we, if we got it uh, uh, as an instance of universal uh, statement with the universal generalization. So in that context T A in place L A can be uh, generalized and you can say that for all x T x in place L x that is precisely what we wanted to prove same thing can be proved uh, by using uh, uh, indirect method as well. So what you do is for all x T x in place P x for all x P x in place L x you list out the same things and you negate the conclusion and then you can see whether uh, uh, it leads to contradiction or not. So let us consider uh, this particular kind of thing and we, we apply indirect method on this particular kind of thing and then see whether it follows or not. So what we have uh, uh, is like this for all x uh, t x all trees are uh, plants and then for all x p x uh, what is there here uh, for all x p x l x or living beings then for all x t x t x in place l x. So what we are trying to do is we are applying reductio ad absurdum method which is considered to be the indirect method. So now what you do here is like this. So now you deny the conclusion t x in place l x. So this is denial of conclusion denial of conclusion. So now as a fourth step what you do is we have some rules for all x p x is same as there exists some x not p x. In the same way there exists some x p x is same as not uh, for all x not p x. So now this will become there exists some x not of t x implies L x. So now uh, this is 3 by definition. So now uh, we need to look for uh, the quantifiers. Uh, uh, this statement starts with the existential quantifier. First you handle that particular kind of thing, you eliminate this one and then you move to this particular kind of thing T A implies L A where x is replaced by A. So this is what we have and then you further simplify it then it will become T A and not L A. So now, now we need to talk about uh, universe this is uh, 4 existential instantiation. So we need to write justification here otherwise uh, it does not make any sense nobody will understand what you have done here if you do not write the justification for this one here on the right hand side. So now 8 you find one instance of this one any one of these things you can handle now. So one instance of this one is since it happens for all x it happens for even a also T A implies P A and then in the second case uh, for all x P X implies L X that means uh, one instance of this one can be this one P A implies L A. So now what we have is like this so it goes like this T A uh, and not L A uh, now uh, sorry you are not supposed to use this particular kind of thing. So now you have T A and T A in plus P A uh, that means uh, 6 and uh, 6 and 7 modus ponens you will get your T A here and T A in plus P A so you will get P A. So now uh, and we have P A in place L A in the eighth step. So now these two mode exponents you will get L A. So uh, 7, 9, 9, 10 for example, 9 and 10 mode exponents you will get this one. 
So now you observe here in this proof, what is the proof first of all? A proof is a sequence of steps and all it ends in finite steps and finite intervals of time. So the each step is considered to be true and all, so the final step is also considered to be true. So now you have LA here and not LA here, so you draw a line like this and then uh, from whatever it is 6 to 9 it led to contradiction. So how did we lay, uh, how did we end up with a contradiction since we denied this conclusion. If you deny the conclusion you end up with a contradiction, suppose if you have not denied it they do not have led to contradiction now. that means negation of the conclusion leads to unsatisfiability, unsatisfiability in the sense that it leads to contradiction. So uh, in that sense uh, the original conclusion is the one which holds. So like this uh, uh, these are the simple examples uh, with which one can uh, solve uh, this particular kind of thing but one can uh, use uh, for the complex uh, cases also one can use this natural deduction method and then one can solve the uh, problems. So there is one particular kind of prescription one uh, uses uh, one uh, make use of it uh, as a strategy that is like this one should only universally generalize from a constant that is introduced by universal instantiation. Uh, for example if you have this is one of the important strategies that uh, we need to use. So let us say for example uh, you have a formula like this for all x uh, px implies uh, qx uh, for all y uh, sorry there exists some y uh, py and qy for example these are the two formulas that are there in your proof just we are trying to talk about some kind of strategy so that you can make use of these rules correctly. So now one instance of this one could be like this P A implies Q A etc. And another instance of this one uh, for example if you say uh, it is uh, uh, P B and first usually we handle this uh, existential quantifier so let us say this is P A and Q Y. So this is an instance of uh, sorry P A and Q A existential instantiation. So now this can be written as P A and Q A. So now uh, the strategy tells us that if you got this formula out of uh, existential instantiation you cannot generalize it and say that it is for all x P X and all. So this is wrong in the same way you cannot generalize Q A uh, and then say that px by using this particular kind of rule. This is an incorrect application of rule because it you got this pa and qa out of the existential instantiation rather than the universal instantiation. You need to apply this universal generalization only when you come across you came across that particular kind of instance through the application of universal instantiation rule otherwise you are not supposed to do it. So how does an individual constant get into the proof in the first place if we limit our attention to direct proofs there are only three possibilities that is an individual constant can be introduced in the premise of the argument that means if you universal instantiation you will you might do it or you might apply uh, existential instantiation and you come across that particular kind of thing and the third one is universal instantiation that is what we have done in the first step. So several uh, there are some other examples complex examples one can take into consideration and then you apply this uh, particular kind of rules and you can deduce this particular kind of theorems. So one can use uh, both direct and indirect proofs to handle uh, this particular kind of situation. Uh, we will end up with uh, one simple example uh, and then we will see uh, we will end this lecture. So we talked about distribution of uh, quantifies with respect to conjunction. So we know that this, this particular thing holds uh, there exist uh, some x fx uh, or there exists some x gx and from this you get fx or gx. So this is what we are trying to prove. Again uh, one can use uh, any one of these methods uh, you can deny this uh, particular kind of conclusion and then start constructing uh, using the 
uh, universal instantiation, etc., all these rules, then you will come up with a contradiction and you say that negation of this one leads to contradiction, hence negation of negation of this formula is going to be the case. So that means the actual consequent uh, remains. So now uh, let us consider this uh, proof of this one quickly and then we will end this lecture. So we had to solve many problems to get ourselves familiarized with this particular kind of technique. So in that context, uh, so I could only discuss how to judiciously use this particular kind of rules and when it, uh, when it comes to the applications in particular and while solving the problems uh, that, that is going to help us. So now uh, you list out uh, this thing for all x for all sorry g x is what is given to us. Uh, this is given or you can write it as assumption etc. So now uh, from this to take into consideration there exists some x f x just one part of it you take into consideration that is also considered to be an assumption. Now fourth one just I'll quickly write it and all. So now one instance of this one is this three existential instantiation is this one. Now fifth step uh, f a g a. So how did we do this thing? There is something called law of addition. Since f a is already true, we can add anything uh, to this particular kind of thing without disturbing the truth value of that. So that means you can write f a r uh, g. So now uh, you can apply uh, existential generalization rule and then this can be this holds for at least one particular kind of situation. So you can generalize it and say that some x for some x this is the case that means f x r g x. So now this is what uh, uh, we got it by taking this particular kind of thing there exists some x f x. But even if you take uh, this particular kind of thing you will get the same kind of result. So this is what we have we are supposed to prove and then we proved it but uh, it might this proof you might get come across this particular kind of thing even by using by taking this particular kind of assumption also. We have either a P or Q kind of situation first you have taken this into consideration and you proved this one and in the same way you take if you take this also you should be in a position to derive this particular kind of thing. So that is you take this particular kind of thing. there exists some x g x. Uh, this is again assumption and all. Now this you take into consideration again you will prove the same thing and that ends that gives us the complete description of your proof. So now one instance of this one is g a 7 existential instantiation now 9 uh, again uh, you can add the same thing f a r g a uh, this is addition law of addition. So like you know suppose if you have a formula A which is already true and all then you can add A or B. Of course you can use the commutative property and you can say that it is same as B or A does not make any big difference actually it should be G A or F A and that is same as F A or G A. So now since you got this one uh, one instance of if you apply existential generalization rule then this will become f x or g x. So now even if you take uh, this into consideration as your assumption you could prove this particular kind of thing and hence there exists some x f x there exists some x g x and you got this particular kind of thing. One final thing uh, remark is this that uh, you can use indirect proof also to solve this particular kind of problem. So that is like this. So this uh, is considered to be antecedent this is considered to be the consequent. Now what you will do here is this that you list out the premises like this there exists some x g x and now you deny the consequent and then you will end up with a contradiction f x or g x this is denial of uh, consequence or something like that. one two this is given. So now up, uh, simplify this particular kind of thing this will become for all x not of 
f x r g x. Now first you need to handle uh, the existential quantifiers then you move to the universal quantifiers. Now once you replace this thing uh, you take this as your assumption there exists some x f x then this will become f of a you replaced x with a in the same way you can take there exists some x g x and then you can start with g a and then you can find the proof of this. Now fifth one uh, not of f x uh, g x one instance of that one is this thing not of f a uh, negation of disjunction is conjunction so it will be not g a since you have f a not f a it closes here itself. So now this is uh, when you take this into consideration. Now you can take this also to consideration the proof will be a little bit different. Uh, so now it will be G entire thing will be same it will be G A not G A uh, some not F A or something like that. So now G A not G it closes and all any one of these things you take into consideration it leads to branch closure. So this is another way of proving the same kind of formula uh, uh, by using natural deduction method. So we will stop here and then we will uh, what essentially we did in this uh, lecture is simply this that we discussed some of the important principles of natural deduction method uh, with respect to quantifiers in the context of predicate logic. We introduced uh, uh, for the universal quantifier we introduced universal generalization and universal instantiation and with respect to existential quantifier we introduced existential instantiation and existential generalization. And then we discussed two different kinds of proofs one is considered to be a conditional proof another one is based on indirect proof which is called as reductio ad absurdum kind of method. So this method is uh, uh, closer to human reasoning in the sense that uh, we are well, we are familiar, uh, well familiar with uh, modus ponens modus tollens etc and all rather than uh, proving a formula nobody uh, usually we do not prove. Uh, particular kind of thing by denying the formula and then see the contradiction etc and all. So in a, in a sense natural reduction method comes closer to our human sense human reasoning but sometimes uh, some other methods might be may fare, may fare better than this natural reduction method. So one important method which uh, unfortunately we are not able to discuss that is in the context of predicate logic which is very essential in the context of computer science that is the method is called as resolution refutation method. We discuss this particular kind of method in the context of propositional logic but uh, the lack of time we will not be able to deal with the resolution refutation method. So in the next class we will be dealing with uh, some of the important theorems of uh, first order logic uh, there we discuss about some of the important theorems such as completeness, compactness and, and the celebrated result in the first order logic that is the Godel's incompleteness theorem.